Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Solutions with Shanti. And I hope you're all having a beautiful Sunday. Um, for those of us who are here today, I just want to welcome you and say thank you so much. And JC, I mean, I'm loving this book, I have to say. And I hope today is not, the, you know what it's like you have when you, you've you just like, said you think it might be the last, but and I'm going like, you. but I know there's lots more to come after this. So, um, yeah. Welcome, Jess, and welcome, everybody. Thank you. So, Jess, over to you. For yeah, the, the good news is she has a whole ton of books. I mean, we could, we could binge, carry on binge forever, her right? other books. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, um, for sure. Yeah, no, this is one of my, one of the most powerful ones. It's A Prisoner and Yet by Corrie Ten Boom. And we've been, you know, going through um, her conversation, you know, all the way from the moment, um, you know, they got arrested for hiding Jews in their home and, you know, through to now they're in, like they've gone past the word camps. Uh, they've been in Ravensbrook now, which was the worst of the women's camps. And um, literally it was by the grace of God that Corey got out. Um, her name ended up mysteriously on the list for um, getting out uh, one week, I think it was one week before they killed all the women her age. So, um, yeah, and uh, may I ask point. why you believe that was? Why would they have killed? And how old was she at the time that she was in I the? Think, I think she was six, fifty or six, like fifty six or sixty six. And any reason why they would have killed the woman her age? Because she was obviously an older person then. Um, I think it was a last, you know, a last ditch effort to take out I mean, as many what? people as they could before, before the, like, right at the end of the war. I think that they, you know, took out as many people as they could. Would that have been maybe in terms of past childbearing age? So they would have seen those women as being obsolete I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I'm exactly why or, you know, they were wanting to kind of hit that next, um, wow. you know, that next uh, layer of ladies. I don't know, but okay, yeah, it's interesting for sure. Yeah. Um, so we're on page 148 and this section is called Lonnie. Our barracks had been originally intended to house 400 people. It now sheltered approximately 1,400. Um, so think about that, 1,400 women in a barracks that only held 400. The women prisoners from many concentration camps and prisons were being evacuated to Ravensbrück. Um, new arrivals were a sad picture. They were often barefooted, always dead tired, at times despairing and sometimes resigned. Thinly clad, they stood for hours and hours in front of the quarantine barracks. The stream of newcomers filled our camp be beyond its capacity, but this overcrowding had been adventurous results, a lack of adequate supervision. We could go on calmly and uninterruptedly, with our daily Bible discussions, Protestants, Catholics, religious trends of all sorts were gathered in harmony, one in our misery, but also one in Christ. There would be no separate Protestant or Catholics, Catholic areas in heaven. Why should there be here? There was something in heaven in this unity. One day in late November, we were startled by the arrival of two new supervisors in our barracks. One was our new often Sharon, uh, which is their officer. On the day of her arrival, she beat a woman so cruelly that she died the following day in the hospital. The other was an additional Stroop Altste, uh, named Lonnie, who worked or who walked about with a strap in her hand and used it as at the slightest protest. We felt that those women were a serious threat to our welfare and decided to start a campaign of prayer for our protection. The following day, I went to our customary place back in the barracks 
for our Bible discussion, and someone whispered to me that Lonnie was sitting in a dark corner behind me. We, we cannot go on with our meeting today, said someone. With a few others, I prayed for protection and for guidance. The Lord clearly directed us to go on as usual. I explained a portion of the scripture and offered a prayer of thanksgiving, and we closed by singing together, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Out of the darkness in the corner came the voice of Lonnie. Nakshlak and Lied, sing another song like that, is what she said. What could this mean? Had she been touched by the singing, or was there something else? We sang another song, and again came the Nakshnak and Slom, sing another psalm. That day we sang more and longer than ever before. The Lord had answered our prayer above and beyond measure. Not only had the danger of law and leap prohibiting our meeting been averted, she actually wanted to be a part of them. She understood the Dutch language because she had kept company with a Hollander. As a matter of fact, that was the reason for her being in the concentration camp. The next day, Betsy went to call her. She was standing beside the stove and thought that Betsy had come to warm herself. No despised prisoner was permitted to approach the stove, and Lonnie seized a blazing piece of wood to drive her away. No, I have not come to warm myself, but to invite you to the meeting, said Betsy. I haven't the time today, she said. She threw the wood back into the fire. The next day, I invited her. Oh, woman, she snapped, leave me alone. That evening, I had a talk with her. What a tragic specimen of humanity she was. What a desperate and despairing creature. At home, she ran a brothel, and she herself had dissipated body and a demoralized soul. She spoke, or I spoke to her, of the love of the Savior for sinners and of the judgment that was to come for those who rejected him and continued in sin. Now you are a curse to us, but the Lord Jesus can make you a blessing, if only you give your heart to him. Ah, said Lonnie, such things are impossible in Ravensbrook. This is a hell. Yes, I replied. I too have come to the awful conclusion that this is a hell. But do you know that the greatest danger here is that you will lose your soul to the devil who resigns in this place and even though it looks as if he were master here, Jesus nevertheless is the conqueror. If you belong to him, you are safe even here. I know that that to be true, for I am calm and happy here in spite of everything, because I am his child. Repent, Lonnie, while there is still time. She actually let me finish what I was saying, but made no further reply. I had a few more such encounters with her, and her attitude did change to some extent. But as long as I was in Ravensbrook, she did not come to conversation. I know, however, that God's word does not return to him void. Eternity will reveal whether our talks have borne any fruit or not. I just want to take a moment. What is kind of interesting, like at the very end of the book, um, right there's a picture here of of her in israel planting trees um but there was the, there's some interesting things that i think came out of all of her conversations and i think particularly with lonnie and like it, there's little glimpses and kind of references to it in her other books and throughout throughout her writings but she never goes into full detail. Um, all that's known is that, you know, like her sister Betsy kept telling her to not forget the soldiers, to pray for the soldiers that they, you know, they went through horrific things too, even though they were having to be the perpetrators. And, um, you know, in the end, Corey ended up working with several churches and ministries. And from what I understand, they bought after the war they bought the concentration camps and they actually turned them into healing centers for the soldiers um so really neat um 
neat thing. So the next section, memorial service for the dead. Two women from Vaught, uh, which was the work camp they were at before Ravensbrook, had passed away. Standing in the entrance of the sleeping room, I spoke a few sentences of brief commemoration. On one of the beds lay the snake, our strublod stay. Um, everyone was absolutely quiet as I spoke, even the Poles who could not understand what I was saying, but who had been told by one of um, their own number that we were having a memorial service for the dead were silent and reverent. Suddenly the snake shouted at me to stop. She was furious. I went on speaking quietly of the faith and courage of the dead and of the urgent need of repentance when every hour is taking its toll of dead. I bore witness to Jesus, the conqueror of death. Every nerve in my body was taught. Such moments revealed clearly the depths of our suffering and the constant peril in which we lived. I heard myself speaking calmly and through it all the hysterical screaming of the snake as she continued to shout at me. I was not afraid, but I was deeply conscious of the fact that two spheres were in conflict at that moment. It seemed to be something taking place outside myself. Then the snake jumped from her bed and rushed at me. May I ask all or ask you all to remember the dead in the moment of reverent silence? I heard myself saying, I closed my eyes expecting the blows to fall. But the silence remained unbroken. As I walked back to my bed, I saw the snake sitting at the edge of her cot. She was still holding the whip and staring fixedly before her. Typhus. Typhus had broken out in the barracks opposite ours. Hundreds of women lived there, crowded together, and now they were not allowed to leave the building. They lay or sat in endless rows, two or three to each row dirty beds the quarantine would last for six weeks and in all that time they would not be allowed outside typhus usually runs its course very rapidly often terminating in a few days at times and even in a few hours now and then we would see someone collapse um, at the lager struss dead Blankets could not be aired or shaken out in that barracks, and the lice that carried the disease multiplied by the hour. More than a thousand women would throng the eight toilets. Clothes were washed under a tap and dried above the beds, where they were reinfected before they were even dried. Would anyone come out alive from that pool of contagion? I knew that drastic measures would be taken if the disease spread. According to National Socialism, mass murder might be necessary in the interest of public health. Sitting in the window of the barracks was a lovely young woman holding a small boy in her lap. He was playing with her long braids. Above his head, his mother was staring into the distance. Timid, uh, timidity. Mrs. Bruins who had tried to defend herself while she was beaten some time ago, had been reported and was now summoned for a hearing. Her charge was attacking and striking an offshoren. I had been present at the time, and now she wanted me to accompany her and explain what had happened. She herself was unable to speak a word of the German language. My German was fairly fluent, and I agreed to accompany her immediately. Although I did feel some reluctance and no and um, no little concern, I had I would have to plead for her before people to whom there was not a semblance of justice, before stupid and cruel officers, the officer and sadist who had been methodically trained to torture people and who kept in practice by daily exercise. But I was not admitted. Miss Bruins had to go in alone, and I felt relieved. What little courage I had, and this was not the first time I had observed cowardice in myself. If I had been a brave woman, I would have ignored danger and have leaped to the defense of anyone who had was being oppressed. 
I would have pleaded. I would have convinced. I would have. I would very often have been op opposed, and most of the time it would have been futile. But if I had succeeded only once in pleading, pleading and winning a case, it would have been well worth uh, the difficulty and the misery. But I was not brave. I was often like a timid, fluttering bird looking for a hiding place. As I pulled my dirty blanket over, over me, I pressed close to Betsy and cried softly so she would not hear me. Coward and wayward and weak, I change with the changing sky. Today so eager and brave, tomorrow not caring to live. But he who gives in, um, or sorry, but he never gives in, and we too will win, Jesus and I. Hate. Are all Hollanders so strong, so calm, and so controlled, and yet so full of hate? Asked a Russian woman. I was startled. Was there so much hate among us? I knew, of course, that one of the worst things that German uh, Germany had done to us was that it had taught our people to hate. I searched my own heart, but no, that was not one of my problems. The Lord had given me so much tender care and love that hatred was no temptation to me. His love filled my heart, and where love resigns or reigns, there is no room for hate. I saw the faults of the German people and the horrors of the present regimes more clearly. I felt them more keenly, perhaps, than many others. I suffered daily from their effects on my person. On the other hand, I had never before so learned to know that the Lord Jesus, as a tender, loving friend, who never forsakes us or casts us off when, he, when we are bad, but rather helps us to gain the mastery over sin, in the foreground of my life, there was hard-heartedness, hard savage cruelty, dismal melancholy, and darkness. But beyond it all, I saw my Savior, his arms outstretched, his face shining with the light of love. Therefore, I could not hate. A Multitude of People Thousands of women were standing in the ranks, according to the barracks. Women from all the countries of Europe, from all classes of social uh, strata, and of all ages. Most of them were political prisoners, but there were also many among whom uh, who had been sentenced for murder, robbery, or other crimes. All of them had been forced to leave their homes, their families, and their positions in life to become slaves in Ravensbrück. Most of them had apparently accepted their enforced stay here dull resignation was um what is that word legibly sorry legibly written in their faces when the siren wailed everyone joined in her work commando there was such a milling around it it seemed that thousands had suddenly been added to the throng i tried to fight my way against the current but felt it was a power against which I had no resistance. It was a sea of prisoners, of stripped, striped dresses and caps. Had there ever been in history been such a vast assemblance of forlorn and wretched creatures? I escaped to our own barracks. Even here, in our beds, we were never really alone. To the left and to the right of us, behind, before, and above us, everywhere were prisoners, but it was much better here. We had many friends around us. I felt their grief more intensely than the sufferings of the thousands outside. But I could bring a message of comfort to those around me. Now and then I would see a face light up as we spoke of the joyful gospel of Jesus Christ. I thought back to my um, cells in uh, Shevin, or sorry, uh, Shevingen. Um, would I care to go back to it? I didn't know. There were times when I longed very much to be alone, even for an hour or two. Betsy said to me at the time, I am beginning to love the multitude. Was she, perhaps, ripening for heaven? Peace and serenity shone in her face. People were comforted just by looking at her. 
the lost sheep. The beds above us were accompanied by several members of the red light commander, commando of the horse. Some of them were pregnant. These women were usually given the preference um, when, so, when selected, that is, those who were responsible for receiving and dividing the food, with the exception of soup for 40 people. Some of them were indescribably filthy. Our food was usually taken to their beds and our bread, butter, and sausage divided by their dirty blankets. Once a week, we were given butter and sausage. On that morning, I would awaken and think, mm, good, today we'll have sausage. We have given only one half of a thin slice, but it was appetizing, and we stretched it sparingly to cover many sandwiches. As I conducted the Bible discussions, these women would often listen from a distance. They were too ashamed to join us. I had often invited them, but without success. Then I tried personal contact and continued to talk to several of them. Sheer wretchedness made some of them long for the change in their lives. When I get back to Holland, said they, I'm going to begin a new life. They talked about Jesus who loves sinners and who bore, or we talked about Jesus who loves sinners and bore their sin also on the cross and who would help them to live better lives. But we emphasized the fact that conversation, genuine conversation was necessary. Halfway measures are all no value. They understood that too. But for them, it was a tremendous step, a plunge into a dark, and many of them were afraid to take it. Three of these young women were sentenced to the guardhouse. They had received jewels and watches from Jews who had come into the camp and who had succeeded in getting these things into the hands of the women before they had to surrender all their possession. The contacts between these women and ourselves had consisted so far of only short conversations of evening roll call. But now the women of our barracks were assembled in front of the guardhouse fence, and the girls were standing like caged animals just inside the bars. One of them called out, Tante Betsy, are you there? Yes, of course I am. How are things going? answered Betsy. Badly. We have to work so hard. It's awful here, and we're so homesick. If only we were back in the barracks with you, that would be a relief. The Lord Jesus is everywhere with you also. We know what he asks of you. Uh, the Lager Pelosi put an end to the, our conversation and drove the girls away from the fence. We were happy that we had been able to establish contact with these fragments of human flotsam. Um, I had been trying to interest our recent converts in them but found that some lack in mercy and love for fellow sinners, which I had observed before in others. We political prisoners were all in this penal camp because of the good we had done. We were being innocently oppressed because of the fact we were able to think of ourselves as good people. It was true that we had done no wrong to our fellow men or to our country. Quite the contrary, that was the very reason we were here. Nevertheless, we were in our sinners. We realize that fully when we judge of ourselves according to God's holy laws, we are saved only by grace, by forgiveness of our sins. That was perfectly clear to me, but so many of my fellow prisoners were religiously uninformed, and I felt it a great responsibility and burden on my soul. I comforted myself with the thought that the Spirit of God would govern the outcome. He would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. I could go on working in complete dependence on Him, and God's kingdom would come in spite of the imperfections of our efforts. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Yeah, so interesting that she brings out you know, and I think that's something to take note of with, you know, the system with Nazism is that they make, you know, goodness into a crime. Um, you know, they were 
hunting the Jewish people. Uh, so in that, you had many countries, including Holland, um, you know, and the Dutch, who basically made a way to, you know, provide housing to get food. Um, in some of her other books, Corey talks about how, um, you know, and they didn't steal, they didn't do anything wrong in that but they had somebody who had worked on the inside who literally would get them extra food coupons. Uh, those few food coupons were how they would get people um, to, to receive and house some of the Jews. Um, so they had a whole system that they had developed and it was all about, you know, saving life and, and um, you know, trying to help people. And yet because of that, you know, they were looked at as criminals, even though, you know, they had done no wrong. And even in the concentration camps, you know, you see them buying for the life of, of both those who are their oppressors, as well as um, those who um, are Jews or those who are captives. So in the throng, during certain hours of the day, there was always a crowd of several hundreds of people in the straub, our anteroom and the barracks. Food was brought there and distributed, and everyone who entered or left the barracks had to pass through the same room. During peak hours, there was a press of people moving in opposite directions. It was fortunate that the atmosphere of our barracks was more good nature and tolerant than that of others. We tried to get through without too much shoving or colliding with others. Our contact or our contacts with one another, however, were much too close for comfort. We often found after we had made our way through the crowd that there were lice on our clothing. Hollanders from other barracks were hesitant about visiting barracks 28 for this reason. I always dreaded going through the straw myself and longed even more fervently for home at such moments. One day I was struggling to get through the crowd. A work commando had come in late and was pressing about the kubel to which the soup was kept. These kubels were really um, ingenious food buckets made on our same principle of thermos bottles. They kept the soup boiling hot. The women who had gone to fetch the bread were also just coming in, their arms filled with broad black loaves, which were piled up on the floor against the wall. In the corner of the room was a table on which a small supply of medicines was laid out. A nurse was sitting beside it, treating the sad parade that passed before her. She had a practice larger than that of many city doctors. The sick were standing in line, and those with wounds had removed their bandages, and I saw some ghastly sights. The nurse was a Hollander, a kind-looking woman who helped her patients with a friendly manner. She looked tired that day, and no wonder, with such a line of misery passing by. To some of them she gave homemade norit, charcoal which she herself had charred and powdered. On the stove was a large pan, of some sort of tea which she gave to those with the more serious into, um, intestinal disturbances. The room was large, but more than half of it was taken up by beds, built all the way to the ceiling, and every one of them was occupied. Some of the women were knitting. Most of them were staring idly into space. I wondered if they were not disturbed by the turmoil around them. It must have been awful to live in the midst of such a crowd. I was making my way carefully through the mass of people when a young woman bumped into me. She was an acquaintance, and I asked, How are you? We were standing face to face, looking at each other. In, a, in her eyes was a world of despair. Annie, don't look like that. Are things so bad? I cannot stand it any longer. If I have to stay in this hell for one more week, I shall go to pieces. But she would have to stay. God does not ask what we can or cannot bear. It took her, I took her hand and began to talk to her. You must not despair, Annie. Jesus is victor. Even if you cannot see it, 
If you are his, you will be given strength to it. He will make you see things from God's point of view, and then you will be strong. But what can I do? Surrender yourself to him. Don't you see that he is standing with arms outstretched? Don't you hear him say, come to me? I would like to very much, but I cannot pray. You pray for me. Then we prayed. We held each other's hands and had our eyes open. No one who saw us standing there could see what we were praying. All around us was the miling crowd of hundreds of people. When Annie moved on, there was an expression of peace on her face. The Lord had heard our prayer. <laughs> Excuse me for one moment. A promise. At night, as we walked to the place of roll call, Betsy and I would pray together. It was walking with God. All around were darkened barracks, and all around were rows of prisoners from into ranks. Above us spread the starry heavens. We spoke and then listened for the answer. How wonderful it would be in heaven when we were we, or sorry, where we shall hear clearly. Now our sin-marred ears make frequent mistakes. Our hearing is often distorted. But it was wonderful to listen, and it was such a great comfort. That night the Lord made me a prompting, or sorry, a promise. Before the onset of severe cold, you will be free. Weeks ago, he had asked me, when I pleaded that it might not turn cold, if I ask the sacrifice of you, will you not also bear the cold? I was so afraid of the cold. At that time, I prayed for strength to endure this also. And now there came this wonderful promise. A little later, at our Bible discussion, I comforted the others. Before severe cold sets in, we shall be released. But I was mistaken. All the prisoners were not to be released until the following spring. The promise had been meant for me alone. To a better fatherland. It was the week before Christmas and Betsy was now seriously ill. She was strangely lethargic and her speech was labored. She had become emancipated in just a few days' time. Her symptoms frightened me, for I had seen them in the women about us. They always ended in death. As I helped her put on her shoes to report for roll call, I noticed that her legs were paralyzed. I then went to the Balakatse and asked if Betsy might not remain behind, but she said, the commander has ordered that even the dying must report for roll call. Mian and I carried her through the dark night and supported her as she sat on the small stool. Was she going to die? When I mentioned the possibility, she said hopefully, that's out of the question. We are going back to the Netherlands together. We shall still do a great many things for others. She was not afraid to die. She always talked about heaven as if she had already been there. She knew that her life was hidden with Christ and God. Later in the day, I could see that her face was changing. She was deathly ill. It was hard to nurse her on the narrow bed we shared. The lack of cleanliness troubled me more than ever. Though I did not believe that Betsy was at all conscious of it, I tried to warm her hands and feet, but observed that mine only grew colder for it. If only I could give her something warm to drink. Never before had I felt our poverty and wretchedness so keenly. The next morning, we again carried her out of the room. But Lonnie came to meet us. This is too bad, she said. Lay her on one of the beds and we'll take her to the hospital after roll call. She actually arranged for a stretcher, just as we had laid Betsy on it. A Polish woman came by. Seeing us, she knelt beside the stretcher, made the sign of the cross, and prayed. With tears in her eyes, she went on. That was the farewell of the Polish woman to whom Betsy had meant so much. Then the sad procession moved towards the hospital. Sleet stung us as we reached the outside. 
I stepped close to the stretcher to form a shield for Betsy. We walked past the waiting line of sick people and through the door into a large ward. They placed the stretcher on the floor, and I leaned down to make out Betsy's words. Must You must tell people what you have learned here. We must tell them that there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. They will listen to us, Corey, because we have been here. I stared at her wasted form. But when all, but when will all this happen, Betsy? Now, right away, oh, very soon, by the first of the year, Corey, we will be out of prison. A nurse had got sight of me. I backed to the door of the room and watched as they placed Betsy on a narrow cot close to the window. I ran around to the outside of the building. At last, Betsy caught sight of me. We exchanged smiles and soundless words until one of the camp police shouted at me to move along. That night, I was able to call on her. She was full of courage and assured me that she believed we were to return together. We were both going back to the Netherlands, she said. And as I sent away by the nurse, she called after me as her final greeting. Remember now, both of us. The next morning after roll call, I walked along the side of the hospital barracks where Betsy was laying. <clears throat> I was too... I was not too worried about her condition because she herself had been so very sure that she would get well. Hopefully I looked through the window next to her bed and there I saw two nurses holding a sheet by its four corners and lifting a body from the bed. I was completely emancipated like a skeleton. It was Betsy. She was dead. I mourned. A great loneliness filled my heart. Alone, alone in Ravensbrook. No more of those wonderful, encouraging conversations. No longer the lively spirit and the childlike faith to buoy me up. But suddenly a sense of peace came over me. Yes, more than that, a feeling of sheer joy. The Lord gave me and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sorry, this just always catches me. So beautiful. Was it God's spirit speaking within me? I went to the washroom where the dead were laid out. There I saw 11 bodies lying on the floor. People who wanted to wash had to step over them. The regime had no respect for the dead. I fled from the room, and a few minutes later, however, I returned, and then I saw the face of Betsy, full of peace and happy as a child. She looked incredibly young. The care lines, the grief lines, the deep, deep hollows of hunger and disease were simply gone. In front of me was the Betsy of Harlem. It was a bed of heaven in the midst of the surrounding hell. I saw how blessed she was and thought of her present state of happiness. Joy flooded my soul and remained there, triumphant over the grief of my loss. At the memorial service that day, I spoke on 1 Corinthians 15. How they loved Betsy, these people to whom I was speaking, and what a sorrow it was for us all. Lily, who was in the hospital, tried to come to me, but was not allowed to enter the barracks. She then came to a window, and as I looked into her eyes, I was reminded of a wounded animal. How dark and burdensome days can be. My soul was the battleground of a struggle between light and darkness, would joy for Betsy release our grief for my own loss and win the battle? I prayed, teach me, Lord, to bear the burden in this dark and weary day. Let me not complain of others, of a land or of a hard and lonely way. Every storm to thee is subject, storms of earth or mind and heart. Only to thy will submitting can to me thy peace impart. So to suffer, so keep silence, so be yielded to thy will. So in weakness learn thy power. Teach me, Father, teach me still. Marusha Going to bed that evening, I saw a Russian woman looking hopelessly about for a place to sleep. 
Everyone turned her away and kindly, and a hunted look came in, haunted look came into her eyes. How awful to be in prison and not to have a place to sleep. Betsy's place beside me was vacant. I motioned to the woman and threw back the blanket to her. She crept in gratefully and stretched out beside me. She was a bright-looking woman, and as she laid her head on the pillow so close to me, I felt the desire to speak to her, but I did not know her language. So I simply said, Jesus Christos, and at once she made a sign of the cross, threw her arms about me, and kissed me. She who had been my sister for 42 years, with whom I had shared so much of weal and woe, had left me. A, wash, a Russian woman now claimed my love, and there would be others, too, who would be my sisters and brothers in Christ. I wondered if the Lord would provide further opportunities for me to give others the love and care of the Father and Betsy, and Betsy or that Betsy no longer needed. The Missing One Two days after Betsy's death, we were subjected to Strapel, a, a disciplinary roll call. One of the 1,400 women in our barracks had failed to appear for roll call. It was a Sunday morning, and we had to stand outside from 5.30 until noon. It was cold, but the sunrise was beautiful. The beauty of the sky colored our entire surroundings. We were in good spirits and told each other that it was really not bad, but my legs and feet were swelling dangerously. In every adverse circumstance, I now felt a background of comfort in Betsy's passing into glory. She no longer had to stand at roll call. They could no longer punish her. The women were counted and counted again, then checked off one by one in the off assurance record book. They disclosed the name of the most missing woman who was the cause of this cruel collective punishment. They found her, a little Polish woman, lying dead in her bed. We had been punished for the absence of a dead woman. Five of us, including myself, became ill because of the appeal. What it was, I do not know. We grew thinner and more wasted each day. Inside the ten days the other four women were dead. After the strawful, one of the girls who was in the guardhouse called out to me, How are you, Taunt Keys? Uh, that was for Aunt Cornelia. The day before, uh, she had called Taunt Betsy, How are you there? Taunt Betsy died yesterday. We heard her sobbing, and Betsy was loved by the three standing there beside the bars. Now I replied, I am fine, I am very much comforted, and thankful that Tom Betsy is really home in heaven. How are all of you? Fine, we have all three been converted. How wonderful. I did not overrate such a remark, but it meant a great deal. It meant at least a new beginning. There would still be a battle, but Jesus is the victor. Our Lord Will you continue to work in them through your spirit and forbid that this be only a transient emotion? Release from Ravensbrook. I, mean, I kind of show here in, a, in the book, it actually shows her um, over here, her release paper. <laughs> it was the following morning when over the loudspeaker during roll call came the words, Ten Boom Cornelia. For an instant, I stood stupidly where I was. I had been a pris I had been prisoner six six seven three zero for so long that I almost failed to react to my name. I walked forward. Stand to the side. What was going to happen? Why had I been singled out? Had someone reported the Bible? The roll call dragged on. From where I stood, I could see almost the entire uh, langer struck. Tens of thousands of women stretching out of sight, their breath hanging white in the night air. When the siren sounded to s signal the end of roll call, the block I'll uh, state took me by the arm. She was unusually friendly. I had known her as a hard woman with cruel eyes and erect military figure, 
She now asked me how long I had been a prisoner and brought me to the camp square. We were joined by a few Germans and one Dutch prisoner, and together we went to the administration barracks and stood in line. An officer seated behind the large desk stamped a paper and handed it to the woman in front of him. Entlassen, he said, entlassen, released. Was was the woman free then? Was this, were we all to be free? He called the name and another prisoner stepped to the desk, a signature, a stamp, entlassen. At last, ten boom Cornelia was called. I stepped to the desk, steadying myself against it. He wrote, brought down the stamp, and then I was holding it in my hand, a piece of paper with my name and date and birth date on it, and across the top, in large black letters, Certificate of Discharge. Dazed, I followed the others through a door at our left. There, at another desk, I was handed a railway pass entitling me to transportation through Germany to the Dutch border. What a Christmas you are having this year, said Allegra Pelosi, and I felt her happiness for me was tinged with a bit of envy. Well, yes, but you won't go back to your country, said another. The Netherlands is free. Not so, I learned later. You won't be able to get across the border. And lesson, but first, another parade of nakedness before a doctor. Such humiliation. The insolent face of that wretched creature looking me up and down with uh, scornful disdain. Odima was his verdict. Hospital. I could think, or I could think the straffle of the previous day for my swollen feet, but prisoners had to be released in good condition. I would have to sign a statement on leaving the camp that I had never been ill and had never had an accident. That's crazy, huh? Even though they were sick all the time. In the hospital barracks. Reporting at the hospital at noon, I was admitted and was then kept waiting in the stab. In it was a large table against the window and a double-decked beds on both sides. All of the beds were filled with patients seriously ill. On the table lay a patient. A doctor of four nurses were working over her. She was suffering dreadfully and screaming horribly. It seemed to go on for hours. A woman who could scarcely walk came out of the large ward. She had only a skirt and was as thin as a skeleton. Her bare legs tottered and she begged for help, but someone called out to her that she could be very well that she could walk alone. There was an expression of unspeakable agony on her emancipated face. Her eyes were bulging with terror. Her claw-like hands reached out for the table. Had I come into hell? My eyes seemed glued to the horrible scene. The screaming of the woman on the table cut through to my soul. I tried to close my eyes and ears but could not. Was this all an evil nightmare? Then I looked around at the many sick women who were also witnessing this scene. Some of them seemed isolated in their own pain. Others had the desolate look of resignation that could be seen on so many faces in Ravensbrook, and some of them were hard and cold. I knew that these had succumbed to the most dangerous disease in the concentration camp, egoism. There will be an end to this also, I said to myself. It was the sop of comfort I always gave myself when things were very bad. It always helped a little, but did not give me the staying power that I needed. You will not leave my soul in hell, I whispered. Savior, you have borne my griefs. A woman with an angry face, my new uh, stop all stay, ordered me to follow her and directed me to a bed among those of the eight other discharged prisoners. Some of them had already been here for two months and were still waiting for a doctor to approve their release. I wondered how long I would have to wait. I had learned to be patient, but this was very difficult. 
I was lying in a high, narrow bed beside a woman with scabies. Around me were German women, all of whom had been punished because they had been having sexual relationships with foreigners. The women and girls around me were horrible creatures. In the large ward, there were many patients who had been mutilated in the bombardment of a train and brought here for treatment. There were also many who had serious operations. The suffering was appalling. But if anyone groaned, one of these discharged German prisoners would mimic her. They were incredibly mean and cruel. Their harsh voices threatened, cursed, and jeered the whole day long. The first night, I was awakened by patients calling Scheiber. I did not recognize the word at the time, and realized only later that they were calling for bedpans. The serious ill and wounded patients were incapable of standing to say nothing on going to the bitterly cold toilet room were begging for them. The most seriously ill were usually placed in the lower beds, but at times, even in the upper bunks, some of these patients tried to help themselves down and fell from their high beds to the floor. Perhaps they were already dying. In any case, altogether weakened as they were, they could not hold on tightly enough, and during that one night, three patients fell out of their beds and died on the floor. The second night I spent in this hell, I decided to take the bedpan chore upon myself. When I saw the suffering at close range, I helped one woman who had to lie on her stomach because part of her back and her leg uh, had been shot away. I lifted her carefully, and as I helped and encouraged her gently, she asked, Who are you? You are a good woman. There are only evil women here. Where did you come from? Just because I treated her with common human decency, I was an exception. Some of the patients seemed to me to be in plaster casts, but later I realized that their bodies were completely emancipated, nothing but skin over bones, and therefore felt hard to the touch. As I helped them, I would tell them about Jesus a little more each night. Opposite my bed were two Hungarian gypsies who were indescribably dirty and malicious. One of them had a completely gangrious foot, which she would at times thrust out of her bed as if she were angrily trying to infect others. In her hand, she held a nasty bandage she had removed from her foot. One night, the bedpans were nowhere to be found. This woman and a few others had hidden them for their own use to escape going to the cold toilet room. I begged the women to think of the patients who were seriously ill and who could not be cared for unless the bedpans had been given back to us, but there was no response. In the middle of the night, a French girl discovered that the Hungarian had a bedpan hidden under her blanket. I took it away and a few minutes later went back to bed. Suddenly I heard the French girl screaming for help. The Hungarian, in revenge, had thrown her filthy bandage over the girl's face. Then she did the same thing to me. In the dark, I saw her dirty hand above my face, I flung the bandage to the floor and hurried away to wash. Back in bed, I was overwhelmed by a sense of loathing and fear. I prayed to the Savior to protect me. I felt so helpless amidst all the evil and danger of infection. A little later, I fell asleep. Danger still hovered around me, but I felt safe in the arms of Jesus. Holy On a bed next to the window, diagonally across from me, lay a feeble-minded girl. She was about 15 years of age, but had a mental development of an 8-year-old. She was completely emancipated, but had a sweet face, gorgeous eyes, and lovely wavy hair. Her face was sweet and very touching as she begged for her mother. She was lying in front of the window, and the first night I saw her, she was... She frightened me. She had removed the bandage of toilet paper and exposed her back, which had been operated upon. The moon shed a ghastly light over her wasted body. I spoke to her softly, and each evening thereafter I would tell her a little more about the Savior. 
The last night I asked her what she knew, and then she told me in her soft, touching voice, The Lord Jesus loves Oli and has borne her punishment on the cross. Now Oli may go to heaven, and Jesus is there right now, busy preparing a little house for Oli. What is it like in that little house? It is very beautiful. There are no wicked people as in Ravensbrook. There is only good people and angels, and Oli will see Jesus there. When you have pain, what will you do? I will ask Jesus to make me brave, and I will think of the pain that Jesus suffered to show Oli the way to heaven. Shall we thank him together for what he did for us and me? Oli folded her hands together. We gave thanks. And I knew why I had to spend this dreadful week in barracks nine. During the night following my release, I was walking in the hospital corridor and observed that the windows were solidly frosted. The water in the bucket had a thick layer of ice on it. It was the first night of bitter cold and the temperature was down to 20 below zero. I no longer had to appear for roll call. The most dreadful of experiences when the weather was cold. I was to be in the hospital a week and would then be free. Now at the time of morning, roll call, I could hear from my bed the rhythmic stomping of thousands of feet. It continued for an hour and a half as the prisoner stood in the wind. God had saved me eight hours before the onset of severe cold. Citizenship There had been some improvement in the treatment of the Hollanders from the dirtiest barracks where they had to live with the Polish women, they were now moved to the cleanest one, which was shared with German women. The Polish women were mostly market folk from Warsaw, who were, as the Polish lady told me, the poorest and filthiest inhabitants of Poland. All of the Hollanders were deluced and placed under the supervision of a more humane uh, blackout stay. The later did not send them out of the barracks for roll call until it was necessary. That saved them at least an hour of standing outside. We heard that great changes for the better had also been made in the treatment of the Dutch men. What was the curse of these sudden improvements, or cause of the sudden improvements? The rumor running through the camp with a great deal of credence was that all Hollanders who had been brought to the camp as political prisoners after the entrance of America into the war had been made honorary citizens of the United States. They were considered as American allies in war. Naturally, we were happy about it and hoped it would be an advantageous effect on our treatment during the period of liberation. I told the story of a dying girl. I think it is much more important that our citizenship is in heaven than Jesus Christ, she said. Rechecked. The next day I had to go back to the main hospital for rechecking. I was approved, and now I knew that I was really going to be free. Coming out of the barracks, I looked about me. Was this actually the last time I would look at the somber place on this bleak and lean misery? In the snow lay the dead body of a young woman. Her small, delicately shaped hands were folded as if in prayer, her knees drawn up as if she had died in pain. Her sweet face, white as the snow about her, was peaceful. Her dark, wavy hair lay in a halo around the head, sharply outlined against the snow. She was elegantly dressed. What could be her story? I do not know. But I could tell one thing about its end. She had been sick and succumbed before she was admitted to the hospital. Many dead were lying in front of the Riviere these days. And at one time, this woman had been happy, well cared for, and surrounded by love. Then the waves of this regime that swept her from her moorings and brought her here, a white flower dead in the blackness of this camp. Toward freedom. Friendly prisoners helped us in the dressing room. There were two of us Hollanders. I did not know my companion, a young woman named Claire Prince. She was ill, but fortunately was being released. 
Eight German girls and women were also being discharged. We were generously provided with clothing. After I was entirely dressed, I was given a package containing my own clothes brought from um, Chevenin and some of Betsy's besides. Altogether, it made it was made quite a heavy pack. We were kept waiting at the gate, and there someone told me that Mrs. Ward and Jansen had just died. That reminded me of the peel of two months ago. Betsy had not stood beside me. The weather was raw and rainy, and I asked her afterwards, how was everything? Fine, she said. It was a wonderful roll call. Miss Ward, thank the Lord for me, for his death on the cross for her. Mrs. Ward had not at first been the least bit interested. She had, in fact, made fun of our Bible discussions. Now she had come to complete surrender, prompted to glory. I said in myself, so I walked out of the gate, comforted and thankful that I had been privileged to testify within these walls to the saving death of Jesus. Yes, even Betsy's death was not too big of a price for the eternal salvation of souls. In an office outside the camp, we had been given back our personal effects, money, and my gold ring and watch. At the same time, we were given a warning. We had been told before that we would receive one. This time, it was one the subject of the misdemeanor of my German companions. Remember now that you are to live better lives and no longer give your bodies to foreigners. Your own countrymen are giving their lives at the front. Every German woman and girl is duty-bound to place her body at the disposal of any German soldier. I leaned wearily against a desk. Haven't you learned to stand yet? snarled an officer. For the last time, I snapped into position. Was I free at last? The weather was beautiful. Everything was covered with snow. An officer escorted us to the station. We climbed a gentle ascent and looked around us. A large group of slave prisoners, sent out to chop wood, were walking between the trees. Driven along by our overseers, they were going to their heavy work, and we, we were walking towards freedom. On the street, we met another group of prisoners who had to build roads and unload potatoes and coal. All of these women and girls would have to go back to camp while we were going to our own country. A feeling of deep melancholy came into my heart. How much I was leaving behind me, all that endless sea of grief. The sun was shining on the frozen lake, and on the opposite shore we could see uh, Fritzburg, with its ancient castle and abbey, picturesque among the hills. The sunlight of the snow was reflected in a myriad of uh, spectacle colors. The pines, with their heavily laden branches, looked like Christmas trees. How hungry I am! We were all taking the train as far as Berlin, where we would go our separate ways. We had each been given enough bread for one day, the ration coupons for three additional days. But somehow my supply of bread and my packet of ration coupons were either lost or stolen on the very first day. As I waited for the train and the Germans would sell me nothing without ration coupons. Without, with my undernourished body, I would somehow have to get through the next days without food. At last the train pulled into the station and we crowded eagerly to it. But it was for military personnel only. Late in the afternoon, we were allowed abroad a mail train, only to be put off two stops further on to make room for food shipment. The trip became a blur. We reached a huge bomb-gutted terminal in Berlin sometime that afternoon. It was New Year's Day, 1945. Betsy had been right. She and I were out of prison. Snow drifted down with the shattered skylight as I wandered confused and frightened through the Camberness station. I knew that I must find a train to Ulslin. But months of being told what to do had left me robbed of initiative. At last, someone directed me to a distant platform. 
Each step now was agony in the stiff new shoes. When I reached the platform at last, the sign was was not Ulsen, but Olsen, a town in Poland, in exactly the opposite direction. I had to cross those acres of concrete floors again. A train was standing on the track, and I climbed aboard. By the time I started up, I was dizzy for lack of food. A couple of German girls told me I might be given something to eat at the National Social, uh, so basically, the National Socialization Fruit and Work Assistance Program to Traveling Women and Children. And so I asked a friendly Red Cross nurse at the station of the small town where she had, where we had to change trains, if there was a National Socialization Free and Work that helped women. Uh, she pointed it out to me down at the far end of the platform. One of the workers opened the door for me, and I told her of my predicament. No food, no coupons. Ah, yes, that's the old story, she said. First use up your coupons, and then ask for food. Get out of here before I call the police, and she slammed the door in my face. Going back to the Red Cross, I told the nurse what had happened. Here, she said, eat this quickly. She subbed a plate of pea soup towards me and stood guard while I ate, lest some superior should happen by. This food was intended only for soldiers. How delicious that soup did taste. There was meat in it. I feasted on it, but felt at the same time like a beggar and looked around apprehensively. Fortunately, there was no one about who should not have seen me greedily bolt bolting this food. One night, Claire and I had to spend an hour or two waiting in the station. As I dozed at an empty coffee bar, my head dropped forward until it rested on the small table in front of me. A blow in my ear sent me sprawling almost to the floor. This is not a bedroom, the furious station agent shrieked. You can't use our tables to sleep on. How hard and unfriendly these people were. We were of no use to our war machine. So really, of what value were we at all? In our good hall, and even the smallest child is taught to respect older people. But that is unheard of in Germany in 1945. I was to meet charitable people in, on one more occasion during the trip. At a large station, I asked an officer if there was a, any possibility of getting some food. He looked at us kindly and motioned to a boy who was driving a motor cart of baggage along the platform. Before we knew what was happening to us, we were sitting on the cart and were being given a ride to a small house just outside the station. Here I took part in a scene that carried me back completely to the genial Germany of pre-war days. A motherly woman placed bread, delicious jam, and coffee before us, and a pretty girl moved about briskly, bringing us everything she could think of. The officer stood by and teased the girl. And has Greddy already telephoned Haas, he asked. Greddy blushed. The woman urged us to eat and enjoy ourselves. Speaking about the officer, she said, he is like a father to us all. Then the air-rated siren sounded, and we had to hurry away. The trains would not stop here for long because bombs were very frequently dropped in this spot. For a few brief moments, I had been in the Germany of former years. Checking out. Claire and I reached the German border in Ostlein. We had to stop there before we could enter Holland. Having found the building before the political police were housed, we were received by several dozen. Dutch Nazi boys and girls who invited us to sit down. One of the girls, a child of about 16, perched on the edge of the table in front of us and said, Well, so you've come out of the concentration camp. I don't suppose you had too jolly of a time in there. Awkward, isn't it, to be a prisoner? It must be pretty nice, seems to me, that you are to be free again. How appallingly ignorant these young people were. I found myself incapable of speech. <laughs> I could just see her, the girl saying all that and her just sitting there like, <laughs> like, what? 
Anyway, um, I found myself incapable of speech. They evidently had not the slightest conception of the cruelty of the regime with which they had voluntarily associated themselves. I was dead tired, but was happy to get out in the street again. Though I took a look, or though I took, or I had a look a long time for a place to stay. We could have spent the, the night among the collaborators of, <laughs> you gotta just say that, so the National Socialists in Front, working of the women of the German, the Virtue Squad. But we would have slept in the snow on the streets before going back into the atmosphere of untruth. Early the next morning, we returned to the station, and from there we crossed the border into occupied Holland. We had passed through many ruined cities of Germany, past the rubble of houses. Early the next morning, we returned to the station, and from there we crossed the border into occupied Holland. We had passed through many ruined cities in Germany, past the rubble of houses where once had lived many happy families, who were doubtless now wandering around in search of shelter. What a curse there was upon this country! What an enormous amount of suffering Hitler had brought upon these people! The Fatherland We were standing in line at the custom shed at the sign of the little station building saying, um, <clears throat> Schwanz. Uh, Clara could sc scarcely stand straight. Her leg was alarmingly swelling. She felt ill, and I, too, was in the end of the, my entrance. A man saw our predicament and came up toward us. It's no go with these legs, he said in Dutch. Suppose you give me that pack. He took Claire by the arm and led us into the customs office, but he finished there before he did, and when we came outside, he was nowhere to be seen. Then two workmen kindly offered their help. Just walk between us, they said, and we'll see you safely aboard your train. We were in Holland, and here there was friendliness and helpfulness. How wonderful it was to be in our own homeland again. During that trip, through Germany, I had felt no real joy about my release. Now I was just beginning to realize it. Now I dared to enjoy it. The Deaconess Home The train was going only as far as Groningen, a city in north northern Holland. Near the station was a Deaconess Run convalescent home. I went directly there and asked to speak to the superintendent. Sister Trevenier came, or cannot come at the moment, for she has to attend a religious service in one of the wards. I'm afraid you will have to wait. Could I have perhaps attend it also, I asked. Why, of course, I'll fetch you when it starts. You may go into the waiting room meanwhile. Nurse, have you anything for me to drink? Yes, but you are ill. I'll bring you some tea and rusk. A few minutes later, she placed it before me, saying, I have not put butter on it, but you are having intestinal trouble, and dry rusk is better for you. I felt deeply touched. Here was a woman who was thinking of me and considering what was good for me. The waiting room was typical of hospital waiting rooms everywhere. On the divan lay a man who had been up all night with his dying wife and was now resting. A boy soldered in and boredom of the convalescence written all over his face. The family of the very sick patient stood whispering together. They were being permitted to visit the sick room one at a time. A moment later, I was lying in a comfortable chair with my legs outstretched on a bench and a wonderful feeling of rest descended upon me. I was in the Netherlands among good people. My suffering was ended. A nurse came to fetch me. In the ward, chairs had been arranged in a semicircle between beds facing together. The elderly minister walked in and a hymnal was handed to me. I could see the nurses and patients glancing stealthily at me. How neat the beds were, how clean the sheets and pillowcases, and the floor was spotless. Now the minister was speaking in a well-modulated voice. He read the words of a hymn. 
which we all joined in singing, I found myself constantly making comparisons, the dirty uh, dormitory, infection-ridden and filthy, the beds full of lice, and then this, the hoarse voices of the slave drivers, the mature, um, melodious voice of Domini Hugenrod. Then we sang, but on this point, there was little contrast. We did sing in Ravensbrook, and that would always remain a precious memory. But the background was different here. Here we were permitted to sing. As in a happy dream, I was sitting in a room of the superintendent. Miss Prince had been taken care of and is already lying in a fresh bed with clean sheets. We shall take good care of her, but now what must be done with you? I don't know, sister. A wonderful feeling of relaxation had come over me. I was surrounded by people, none of whom were angry with me. I knew that. She touched a bell and a young nurse entered. Sister, take this lady to the nurse's dining room and give her a warm dinner. The young nurse took my arm, and as she walked down the corridor, she asked, Where were you, or where are you actually going? Where is your home? In Harlem, I replied. Oh, do you know Car Corrie Ten Boom there? I looked at her and recognized her as one of the YWCA leaders. Trent Spence? I exclaimed in delight. Why, yes, that is my name, she said, but I don't believe I know you. I am Corrie Ten Boom. Oh, no, that's impossible. I know her very well. I've been at camp with her several times. But really, I am she. We looked at each other, and both of us laughed. I had caught a glimpse of myself in a mirror and understood why she had not recognized me. My face was thin and pale, my mouth wide, my hair fell queerly about my face, and my eyes were hollow. My coat was dirty, for I had at times laying on the floor of the train. The belt was hanging loose, and I had not enough energy left to fasten it. In the dining room, we sat opposite each other at a small table, and I asked about our mutual acquaintances. Was Mary Barger still living? Jean Blucher? And it was ridiculous to ask such questions. After all, I had it had only been a short years since I had last heard from them. But what a long, long year it had been. I ceased my questioning. I was eating potatoes, Brussels sprouts, meat and gravy, and for dessert pudding with currant juice and an apple. I had never I have never seen anyone eat so intensely, said one of the nurses later. She had been watching me from a nearby table, and with every mouthful of food I swallowed, I could feel new life streaming into my body. I had once said to Betsy in camp, when we get home, we shall have to eat carefully, perhaps taking only small amounts of food at a time. No, said Betsy, God will see to it that we shall be able to retain all sorts of food right from the start. I was not eating lightly. Truce kept putting more on my plate. How wonderfully good the food did taste, and I shall remember that meal as long as I live. Then came a warm bath. They could hardly get me out of it. Just one minute more of that refreshing water around me. My poor, sick skin, damaged by life, seemed to become softer at once with the wonderful warm water coming out of the bath. I felt like a new being. And then they dressed me. There proved to be several um, ex-leaders of the Netherlander Girls Club among the nurses, and a couple of them provided my toilet. One of them was lingering before me, another shoes and dresses and pins for my hair. They dressed me up as if I were a doll, and I felt so happy that I laughed with sheer joy how sweet they were to me. These young women had been trained in kindness to others. In that evil place from which I had just come, I was in the power of men and women who had been trained in cruelty. Now I was surrounded by love and friendship and care. I was then taken to a lovely bedroom, the room of one of the nurses who was away on leave. As I lay in the bed, I looked around. How lovely the combination of colors. It seemed to be starved for color, for my eyes had 
could not gaze enough to satisfy them. My bed was dig delightfully soft and clean with thick woolen blankets, light in weight but warm. Tucked under my swollen feet was an extra pillow placed there by a thoughtful nurse. On a shelf was a row of books. Outside, I heard the whistle of a boat and children calling to one another. Far in the distance was the soft singing, and then, oh, the chimes of Car Carleon. I closed my eyes and tears wet my pillow. One of the nurses took me to her room where I heard a radio again for the first time. A record of Gunther Raman playing the Bach trio was being broadcast. The organ tones pulled around and enveloped me. I sat on the floor beside a chair and sobbed. It was too much joy. I had rarely cried during all those months of suffering, but now I could not control myself. My life had been given back to me as a gift. Harmony, beauty, colors, and music. They who have suffered as I did and have returned will understand what I mean. Two mounted police called at the deaconess home. How are the two prisoners from Germany? Fine, but how did you know that they were prisoners? We saw them at the station and were sorry that we were not free at the time to help them. But we did follow them until we saw them enter the deaconess home. We knew then that they were in good hands. Oh, it is easy to see that they were prisoners. They looked so bad. In Holland, people were interested in caring for the aged and weak. How wonderful it was to be home. Harmony. I was in the church for the first time, a mighty cathedral with colored windows softening the light, lofty arches and columns, all speaking of centuries of devout tradition. The organ began to play, how wonderfully touching its tones. What harmony there was in color, light, and sound, and also the atmosphere of praying people who had gathered to hear about God. Oh, I knew they were sinful people with many petty ideas. But how wonderful that they were here. God's love had drawn them to this place. I was again making comparisons, the gray and black monochrome of barracks, the dirty cinder streets, the screaming, the scalding, the moaning of Ravensbrook, a sphere of sadism and suffering. First disharmony, then harmony. The minister read from the Bible, and I listened. My soul was thrilled and lifted heavenward as we prayed. Home. I was once more at home in the house of, we'll just call it the Bartle. Much had been stolen four oriental rugs, my typewriter, and what was worse, the watches and clocks that had been left at our home in re for repairs. I also missed certain books. Now, why had they been taken? Did the men who had come to arrest me think perhaps that there might be valuable papers hidden in them? But I was not looking for what was missing. I was enjoying the many things that had been left. My piano was still there, Father's painted portrait, the beautiful paintings of Molly, Father's chair in the antique cupboard, the buffet of in the dining room. Oh, there were many precious things left. But I was there alone. The two who had lived with me in this house, with whom I had shared such an unusually harmonious life, were no longer there. I stood leaning against Father's bed, thinking about the present happiness. They were seeing the solution of problems more clearly than I could on earth. They were seeing heavenly colors and heavenly music. How much, how blessed both of them had been in their capacity to enjoy life. That would not be unlimited. And two, they were many seeing the Savior. They were at home in a much deeper sense than I was. And someday I too would go home. I was happy my joy in their happiness shown through the grief of my loss. I dared to be happy. My life had been given back to me and would perhaps still have opportunities to help and comfort people. I had been purged and purified and had learned from experience much that I had only superficially believed before. Persecution, distress, hunger, nakedness, 
Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. More than conquerors through Christ, also over difficulties yet to come. Much work I hope to lay ahead of me, perhaps loneliness too. No, not loneliness. I would love others, and then one does not long remain lonely. Our home had always been a hospital one, and it would continue to be so. The Girls Club My senior scout club, the Rangers, had meetings with me for the first time. The young people were sitting all around me. Some of them had pressed their hand in silent emotion. Others had enthousi enthusiastically slapped me on the shoulder. Tata Keys, it's wonderful to have you back. What a joy it was to see all their faces and were now turned towards me with such confidence. They had developed spiritually during the past year. They had met faithfully without me almost every week though most of them were thin and undernourished and hard-worked. They had become more independent. They had had a hard time chopping wood, bringing food from distant places, and riding bicycles without tires, things they had never been able to do before. Uh, they had now learned through hardship. I told them about my experiences. If you belong to the Savior, you need fear nothing. I have learned that by experience. He is stronger than all temptation. Shall we work together to dispel some of the darkness about us? There is a disrupted Netherlands to be rebuilt. Shall we help in its reconstruction in the strength of Jesus? In him we shall be more than conquerors. What a joy it was to lead them. But there were young people everywhere and opportunities everywhere. I could see in my imagination the Langerstrut. Roll call had just ended before going into the Simon Commando. Two young girls approached me. Taunt Keys, give us a message for today. I repeated to them, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Fear not, only believe. A few minutes later, they were walking rigidly in step as they marched off to the factory. As my scout group was leaving, one of them came back and said, Go with us to the country at Easter time, won't you? And are you going camping with us this year? I answered absentmindedly. My thoughts were with those I had left behind. Ravensbrook was not yet free. Memorial New members had been confined to the Groat Creek. Um, the day before... May the 5th, the occupying German forces had surrendered, but they were still in Holland. The Canadians were expected to arrive at any moment. The church had filled to capacity. It was the first service of liberated Harlem, and I sat in the high point that had been my place for the past several years. The sun was shining through and the stained glass windows splashing, the white walls with color. The organ was playing, and then the congregation saying if god had not stood with us and strengthened us to stand how soon we would have fallen and perished from the land after the closing prayer we all rose and there was a moment of absolute silence we were thinking of those who had died one moment of silence father betsy piet and so many others then the organ started playing the vil vilhelmus our beloved national anthem, but I could not join in the singing, and there were others like me. Outside the rope market was full of flags, and people were screaming out of the church. Suddenly we heard shots. Cars were coming out at a furious speed, cars filled with Germans who were shooting right and left into the crowd. We ran into the, into the area. Now what could that mean? We would not really be free until later. The enemy was still in the land. Shaved heads. There was shouting in the streets outside my window, a jostling, jiggling throng of passing by. There was laughter and blowing of horns and the singing of um, the House of Orange, which is a specific song. They went to the window and looked out. What a crowd of young men in the street. They had suddenly come out of 
of months and even years of hiding underground. What a number of children. Many of the later had never celebrated the House of Orange before some of them had five years ago. But five years is a long time to a child. What a lot of orange color. Where could it all have come from so quickly? I had a sudden impulse to join in the fun and to follow the crowd to the Grote Market. My legs were still not functioning very well, but I leaned on the arm of one of the family. How crowded the market was and how happy the people were. Germans were still walking around, but they were ignored. They would soon be gone and would not do us any more harm. Suddenly, everyone hurried to the direction of Stadthuis, and there we saw three girls being dragged up the steps. Several men surrounded them on the steps. The girls were Hollanders who had had relations with German soldiers. The people around me were laughing, screaming, and shouting, and in front of the Strat House, scaffolding had been erected. I couldn't imagine why it was there, but it stood in the same spot as had the scaffold in the dark Middle Ages, and I shivered. Now I could see the face of one of the girls. Her head had been raggedly sh uh, shorn. The long strands of hair still hung about her face, but she looked much like the girls in the prison. She was livid with suppressed fury. To me, she looked like a backward child. Her face was coarse. Flowers were thrust in, into her hands, and a boy seized her arm and moved it in time to the singing of the House of Orange by the crowd. Another held flowers over her head, and finally orange-colored paint was smeared all over her bald crown. For a second, her eyes met mine, and I felt like crying out to the boys who were tormenting her, be careful, you are destroying something. An older woman was was next dragged to the front. She was wild and tried to defend herself, her dark eyes glittering fiercely, and the people around me shrieked with laughter. This woman was much more fun than the other, who had submitted passively to being shown, but she was powerless against the superior strength of her captors, and her head was clipped, and also was the neatly waved head of the next victim, a pretty girl, who submitted in silent fury to the shearing. Someone in the crowd then started to sing the Wilhelmus, and she too had to keep time with them. But this was awful. The Wilhelmus was so sacred to me. I turned away, and after I reached home, I could hear the procession going. I heard the laughing and the screaming, but did not look out. The girls who were being led past my house were guilty, and I could understand how those who were tormenting them had come to do so. They had been so provoked. They had long borne in silence the humiliating persecution of the men these girls had so easily accepted, and the joy of liberation must have its expression. But this was not the way. Yet might it not have been worse in Holland's... Um, hatchet day the day of reckoning i had often thought with concern about those who would on the day on that day be the objects of hate that they themselves were engendering in the hearts of the otherwise peace-loving people almost every hollander had his own personal sorrow his own experience of humiliation his own score to settle how dreadful it would be and later on he would have to look back to the day of liberation with shame because of the murder of a fellow man. How did it happen that God restrained the powers of evil on that day? Was it because many hearts were praying? I do believe so. I know that a queen was praying for the Netherlands. I was looking through a beautiful house in the magnificent woods. The fragrance of flowers was being wafted inside through the open windows, Birds were singing, and I stood at the window for a moment, looking out over a field of colors, with patches heavily in bloom. The trees were varying shades of green. No, this is not a fairy tale I am about to tell. It really happened. Have you observed how beautiful the woodwork is? asked the owner, as she rubbed her hand lovingly over the elegant paneling. I recalled a dark night in the concentration camp at Ravensbrück. Betsy had awakened me with, 
Our house is so elegant that the woodwork is equally beautiful throughout the entire house, and it should be too, because the people we are going to help will need such an attractive environment that they will forget this dreary camp. Had Betsy been prophetic? This house would soon be a happy home of people who had been released from the wretchedness of imprisonment. We would work together in the fields, in the woods, in the garden, and in the house. There would be singing and playing of good music. This was not to be merely a rest home, but a place of recuperation, where the Netherlands would rebuild, where some of its wounds would be healed, and where people would regain their zest for living and working. Later on, this home would be used for others who had never been in a prison, who would find healing here. Who? That I did not know, but God would send them to us. Sorry. Just so beautiful. Later on, this home would be used for others who, who had never been in prison, but who would find their healing here. There would be obstacles to overcome. It would take money, a great deal of money, and our country was poor. What should I do for fuel? How should I obtain nourishing food? We would have to begin very soon, and there was still much that we needed. How? Looking back into the past, I whispered, persecution, distance, hunger, nakedness, and all of this, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Then I prayed, Lord, I am expecting much from you. Take my hand in yours and lead me as your child. Let many souls find you in this home. And I'm going to end it there. Lord, let many souls find you. So I'm going to take a drink for a moment and open it up for you guys to share your thoughts, your heart, what you heard. Any one of the viewers want to share something? Well, I got to say, I'm sitting here listening and I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that Betty died. <laughs> that, that was quite a shock for me, I must say. Um, yeah. It's just kind of like just at the moment of leaving where, you know, they kind of can get out. That happened. Um, but yeah very very touching i have to say um it it's it's it leaves me speechless and i'm not always speechless <laughs> yeah very touching very touching indeed um I wonder, you know, I sit and I wonder how people who've been through what she's been through actually adjust to normal life again and what is normality after that, you know. I think it's such a huge step to take from that kind of abuse, uh, and it is abuse, there's no other word for it, I don't think. Um, it can only, you know, it... To me, something like that does two things to people. It either turns them into the abuser or it turns them into someone with so much compassion and such a healing heart. Mm -hmm. And I think observing what she experienced now, she's turned out, it's that healing heart. And it's amazing how her work has just carried through, right, mm -hmm. after all this time. I think it's very beautiful, very touching. Yeah, and as you can see, you know, she was just the right person that right. as I got out of that system, you know, the 
there was so much healing the Lord gave to me through her words and just being able to relate, to connect, you know, somebody yeah. else who, you know, had gone through such tragedy and yet in that, you know, understood the the power of God and still, you know, her heart's desire was God's will above all else. You know? Right. Absolutely. And 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 she it's it's like she interpreted God's word so perfectly. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. You know, I think there are certain people that can really interpret God's will and God's desire in such an amazing way and so perfectly on time and in tune. And I think she certainly is one of those. And it's wonderful that her work is continued and continuing, you know, and still touching the lives of so many people. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. Yeah, you'd love her. The next book after this one is um, Tramp for the Lord. And in that one, she starts to talk about after she got out and, mm -hmm. You know, her, I think it was tw almost 11 tw or 20. It was probably longer because she lived to be 81. And I think she was about 68 or so. So she had about 20 years of ministry after that. And, uh, you know, she outlines and still arguing, wrestling with God the whole way. And, you know, yeah. I just love her humor in that. <laughs> Never stops arguing with God. Poor God. <laughs> no. <laughs> with all these cheeky children. <laughs> right. A shame. Yeah. But I, I think, um, Chantel, I think you had a, that was a really good question. And that is maybe some of it is you were kind of saying it in a rhetorical way, but in truth, there's a practical component too. If we look at her and go, man, she's amazing, like a superwoman, and and that's she's just different than you or I, then maybe we move we miss the lesson. And maybe the lesson I'm proposing is in the everyday acts that she had. Number one, she valued the word of God and she protected it and kept it safe no matter what. Yeah. She kept her Bible and was, and that was showing this dedication to the Lord, which is one thing. The other one is perpetually asking the Lord for strength. And then another one was she was looking at others, how she perceived that the Lord would look at them despite their actions, almost like, almost like forgive them for they know not what they do. Mm -hmm. that perspective so the keeping the word of god as sacred the perpetually praying and then her actions are you know she's trying to be like jesus mm -hmm. so nice. those are what i the get living, li living the word <laughs> yes, yes applying yes. applying the yes. teachings that's what i see it as absolutely yes. the application yes. of the yes. teachings that's how they come alive is when we apply them and 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 act them. We walk them. We walk the talk. Yeah, yeah live it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, Janice, go ahead if you would like to oh, chime in. Right. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, I'm late because I didn't know this was going on. I just became a Patreon oh. early this week. So yeah, surprise. <laughs> this is lovely. Um, I am a wreck. Um, I'm very familiar with her. I'm in my 60s. So I'm very familiar with her, with Corey Ten Boone, but I'm not familiar with his book. And you know, what I'm seeing so much in a body, um, I've been in ministry for over 40 years. 
And um, the hearts are growing cold. And the love has grown cold. And we have so many hurting people and I'm ministering, you know, there's people that God's sending across my path that even were born into satanic ritual abuse and are, it's, it's not, it is not wave a magic wand and boom, you're fine. And even those that were not born into it, but have been under the influence of it, it is a time of healing and it's a time, it's a process and it's a restoration process. And over and over, these people, they need a safe place. Okay. And they need to be loved. And the beauty of what she was talking about, of the ornateness of the home and all of that, I really believe um, my personal take on all this, especially since July of 2019, I saw divisions taking place in the body of Christ and the spirit. And I saw things being stripped away and the remnant coming up. And there's been divisions since then over and over and over again of the remnant. And now I see the bride. Well, you know where this is being heard. Oh, I'm well, sorry. Oh, Mary, would you mind uh, uh, muting your mic? Go okay. ahead, Jenna, sorry. And then um, I just see... I think God is arising the bride and the beauty of the bride, but he is giving those that have been so broken, um, literally beauty for ashes. And he's bringing them into a place of such beauty where it no longer is partaking of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but we are coming back into the glory and the rest of that is going to be removed. And we are coming back into such a purity of knowledge and relationship and intimacy with him that all the other is going to be removed. And there's, there's such healing and there's such a place of, I'm sorry, I don't have the articulation for this because I've been swimming in it, especially the last week, but we are coming into a place in the spirit that is going to be incredible. And in that purity is where his glory and his power will be released, that then we as carriers are going to release in um, what is coming. But love, unconditional love, not love with um, lenses of how we see people. But even when I was praying this morning, um, every situation, no matter what it is, Every person, it needs to be not a formula, but father, what do they need? What is that? We don't want to, we don't want to be like, what are those rifles, AK-5 or whatever, that you're just shooting and you shoot bullets everywhere. Why not just shoot one and hit it on the target? And whether it's against the enemy or whether it is an arrow that's bringing healing and life and restoration and go for that one specific thing so that hope is restored and hope brings forth instead of people finding themselves, it didn't work. I'm yet not healed. And I think it's so key, really key to listen to Holy Spirit right now. Mm -hmm. Really key to be led by Holy Spirit and get the Father's heart and lay everything else aside. Because we are called to walk as sons and daughters, led by the Spirit nothing else. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter what the, what the procedures were and the formats are in the past. We need to walk in the moment, in the presence with the heart of God and with the heart of Holy Spirit, releasing what they desire to bring people into restoration and healing. And they need a safe place. And that's the only way they're going to, only place they're going to find it. And I'm sorry. That was, no, I'm that just, was very good. Very I insightful. was so blessed by what she was saying because it was, yes, all these many, many years ago. It is today. It the is world. today too. Yeah. It's still, you know, that's part of what grips my heart is, you know, like she realized too, like that there was such a um, infiltration, you know, that even after she was out, she still, there wasn't, still wasn't full freedom because of you know how deep things went so um but i agree with you it's still very much real today lizanne you had some stuff uh go ahead and share 
sorry, I had to find that button again. Um, it just is such a boon to my heart because, uh, you know, learning some bad stuff on one side, but at the same time, on my mom's side, we're we're from the Netherlands. We're we're from the Christian Reformed Church or Dutch Reformation. Or um, my mom's name is even Corey, and she had such horrible. Her first four years of life were spent in an Indonesian concentration camp, and saw horror too. And yet, you know, I I I can have. I've wondered what what would I do? Would I fold? Would I be like my Oma's mother who became named as righteous among the nations by the Israelites because of how many people she saved? Would I have the courage to do what Corey did, which got her in so much trouble and there was so much loss? And just this book just makes me feel so much stronger you know just to lean on the lord it's not leaning on yourself when i'm asking these questions i'm thinking of leaning on myself but then when i realize you just lean on the lord you just mm -hmm. lean on the lord and it doesn't maybe make the picture around you change but it does make the picture around you change mm -hmm. so i'm very grateful for you to have read this book i uh, i've actually never read cory ten boom although i've been aware of her and um so and i've been to her house even but yeah. uh yeah so it's just really wonderful that that you have done this, Jesse. I appreciate Thank it you. very much. And Chantel for hosting it. And um, yeah, it's just really wonderful. So yeah. that's all I want. And for to those say. of you who are new, I know Chantel puts up on her, um, is it on solutions that you have the past book clubs so they can go back and hear from the beginning? Yeah, so you're welcome to go back and uh, check out the, you know, from the beginning. We have had a lot of good discussions through this book. You gotta unmute. <laughs> I'll I'll post it on the Patreon again when I put it up. Um, it's usually a week from now. It'll usually be in a week from now that it goes up okay. on the on the Solutions channel. Yeah. All right, and then Perfect. Linda has her hand raised. Go ahead, Linda. Linda? Yeah, she's. it looks like she's trying to unmute. Okay. <laughs> you can go, yeah, if you configure. Did you mean to have your hand up? Not sure. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. <laughs> we just wanted okay. to give you the opportunity to talk if you wanted that. Well, let me, I'm going to go ahead and I'll close this up in prayer. And I want to say thank you again. Uh, for all of those who have attended heavenly father we thank you for we thank you for Corey's life we thank you for her faith we thank you that through the midst of storms that she was just so rock solid lord um in what in staying close to you that that really she pressed in and out of everything you know that's what she taught us to do was just to always, in all things, draw near to you. And I thank you more than that, that as we do that, that you are a God who is with us. You are a God who hears our prayers. You are a God who speaks to us. You are a God who answers those prayers. And we ask to just be able to dwell in your house all the days of our lives to be near you, to be with you, to bless your name because your name is high and lifted up. And we ask that we may rejoice, that as we live, we may rejoice. We ask this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, beautiful JC. <laughs> yeah. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I know you guys have just had a time change, although I don't have a time change. So yeah. I don't think it should have affected you guys too much in terms of that. 
Um, yeah. But yeah, I will let you know when the recording is up on solutions. And right. And we'll you... have to, for the next time, we'll have to, maybe we'll take a, a poll. A, we'll put a couple of books out there and see what people Yay! would like to. For the next one. <laughs> like for the next one. So. Yeah, exactly. That'll be a good, that'll be a good one. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you first Sunday of next month again. That's when the book club is. God bless you all and take good care.